Hello everybody and welcome into Simply Revised, a place designed to encourage, equip, grow, and strengthen our faith in the Lord. My name is Steve and today we're going to be jumping back into a lesson series where we are exploring the character of God. In Exodus chapter 34 and verses 6 and 7, God describes himself as compassionate, full of grace, one who is slow to anger, loyal, and forgiving. Today we're going to be looking at the characteristic of God's loyal love. Let's get started. How would you describe God if, if you were to sit down and write a letter to someone about God? How would you describe God? Well, as we have noticed, the ancient biblical authors describe God as one who is compassionate, one who is full of grace, slow to anger, loyal, faithful. Exodus chapter 34 and verses 6 and 7. This is where God describes himself to Moses, and this is where we have based our series of lessons. This morning, we're going to focus on the attribute of loyal, of God's loyal love. And I think to help us kind of start to, to understand this and get our heads around it a little bit is I think it's helpful if we go back and look at the example of Ruth. And for those of you who may not be familiar with Ruth's story, the book of Ruth is in the Old Testament. It's a small book. And it's kind of in between uh, the Judges and 1 Samuel. And it's, it's only a couple of pages. So if, if you're looking for it in a Bible, it's going to be quick. You're going to have to kind of search. But Ruth is powerful. And if you've never read this short little scroll, let me encourage you to do it. We're not going to cover the entire story this morning, but it would only take you probably about 15 minutes to read the scroll of Ruth from beginning to end. And if you've never done that, I would certainly encourage you to do so. But Ruth takes place during the time of Israel's judges. And if you're familiar with that time period of the Bible, this is just a very dark time in the history of Israel. It's very uh, tumultuous. And there's a famine in Judah. Ruth uh, I'm sorry, Naomi's husband is named Elimelech. And to escape the famine, Elimelech, I'll get that name right, takes his wife Naomi and their two sons, and they flee to the land of Moab. And we're not going to cover this too much, but Moab, <laughs> these were almost enemies of Israel. There certainly was a lot of conflict between them. But this is where Elimelech takes his family as he seeks to flee from this famine in Judea. Judah, I'm sorry. But once they get there, things take a disastrous turn. Naomi's husband, Elimelech, he dies. And very soon afterwards, his two sons die. Naomi is left as a widowed woman, and, and her sons had married women who were from Moab. And so there's these three women who are now widowed. <laughs> Naomi is in a foreign culture, in a foreign land, in Moab. But what she decides to do, she hears that God has been generous and has provided bread to her home. And so Naomi decides to go back to her home. But we need to press pause for just a moment. And you need to remember and consider the culture of their day. Right? So here are these three women who are widowed women. And in their culture, they couldn't just go out and get a job. They were in destitute situations. Survival would have been very difficult for them. 
this was a time when there wasn't much of a safety net for people. If you got sick, if you were injured, even a, a, an accident, chances of your survival were very, very limited. So here are these three women. They're widowed. And Naomi understands that to go back to her homeland, to travel back to Judah, is going to be a very treacherous trip. It's one she may not survive. And she tells her daughters-in-law, you go back to your home. You go back to your fathers. Because she realizes how difficult the journey is going to be. But Ruth does not return to her father. Ruth refuses to leave Naomi's side. And notice her words, Ruth chapter 1 and verses 16. Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. The return to Judah would not be an easy trip. And in fact, going home for Naomi would not be easy either. But Ruth is loyal to Naomi. Ruth has an unwavering devotion and love for Naomi, and Ruth will not be turned away from Naomi's side. I'll let you read the story to see how it ends and to see how their journey ends. But this is how God describes himself in Exodus 34, this loyal love. He describes himself with this type of love that will not Depart a love that will not be turned away, a love that is devoted. This is the type of love that Ruth demonstrated to Naomi. It was a generous, it was an unconditional love. Ruth's love for Naomi was an expression of who Ruth was. It was an expression of her character. And that's what we see in the story of God. As he describes himself, this characteristic of loyal love, it's a characteristic of who he is. God is faithful. God is loyal. But to set our context for a moment, Exodus 34, we have spoke about this. It's in the context of where the time when God leads the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. The ten plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea, the covenant at Sinai, you're familiar with this story. That's where we are as we are in Exodus 34, God's deliverance of Israel from Egyptian oppression. But this loyalty, this loyal love of God, as he describes himself, it's connected back to a promise that God made to Abraham, or Abram, Genesis chapter 12. Notice this with me. The Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, and from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the promise God makes to Abram, to Abraham. And notice that no matter what Abraham may do, God commits to bless him, to bless Abraham. 
And it's through this blessing that God commits himself to that all the nations of the earth are to be blessed. If you don't get anything else out of today, I wish you would get this. This is the story of God. This is what God desires to do. It's the story of God and his creation to bless all of his creation. Why did God partner with Abraham? It was so that he could be a blessing to the other people, the other nations. This is what God is committed to do, to honor his promise, to be loyal to his word. It's the story of what God is doing through Scripture, beginning here and running through his son, Jesus. It is the story of God working in his creation through his son, Jesus. And if we could get that, if you could understand that story, God intends from the beginning to bless his creation. You can begin to understand the story of the Bible and the story of God. And it does begin at the beginning. Think back for a moment to the garden where God created this garden, this Eden, and he placed Adam and Eve in this garden. And what were they there to do? They were there to cultivate, to flourish. God wanted to bless his creation. And this includes all of God's creation, including you and me today, God's desire is to bless you, to bless us, his creation. But what happens, right? Page two, we know the fall. The image bearers, Adam and Eve, betray the image of God. They take on the image of another creature, a serpent that's there in the garden. And they fail to be the image bearers that God has called them to be. And this is a narrative that we see over and over and over in the Hebrew Scriptures, where people <laughs> fail to honor God, where they fail to be the image bearers that God calls them to be. Although God continually demonstrates his loyalty to his promise, even when people fell. You recall in the Exodus, when the, the children of Israel were coming out of bondage, out of the land of Egypt, and what were they doing? They were fearful of the nations around them. And they want to appoint a new leader. They don't like this Moses guy. They want to appoint someone else who will lead them back to Egypt, back to their bondage. Because they're failing to trust in God. But Moses intercedes for the children of Israel. Numbers 14 and verses 19 through 20 pardon the iniquity of this people. I pray. According to your greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now, then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. Although people continue to fail, they fell in honoring God. They fell in being the image bearers that God had created for his people to be. God remains loyal. He remains committed to his promise, to his covenant. And Jesus is God's loyal love. Jesus is God's loyal love. Where people have continued to fail, where people have continued to fail in upholding the commitment, the covenant of God, where they failed to be image bearers, God upholds his promise in a dramatic way. He becomes human in Jesus. And he steps into our world. He binds himself to the humanity 
and the human and the person of Jesus. Why? Because we're going back to the promise of Genesis 12. God's desire is to bless all nations. That has been his desire from the beginning. And he is committed, he is loyal to that promise, to that covenant. But what do people do with God's gift of love? What do people do with the gift of Jesus? They reject it. They reject his gift and they nail it to a cross. They crucify God's gift of love. But here is where the story that we're talking about meets Easter morning. The story of Easter. In Luke chapter 24, in verse 1, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And they went and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he is risen. God's loyal love expressed through his son, Jesus. God remains committed to his promise. And when the tomb was opened up, a new way opened up for God's creation. God's desire is to bless all nations of the earth. God is loyal. He's loyal to his promise. And in Jesus, you and I today have this opportunity to step through the empty tomb into new creation. You see, the story of Easter, it's not so much about Easter bunnies and eggs and chocolate candy. I hate to tell you that. The story of Easter is about new creation. It's about new life and a new beginning. You see, we, we have done this. We have often looked at the tomb, the empty tomb, from the wrong perspective. I'll do my best to describe what I mean. But you and I, most of the time, we look back into an empty, cavernous tomb. But I think the challenge for us is not to look back into the empty tomb, but to stand in that tomb and look out. As that stone is rolled away and the sun of a new day dawns and the light comes bursting through, Jesus stepped out into a new day. He stepped out into new creation. And you and I today, we are invited to stand there in that tomb and step out into new creation, to step out into a new day. That is the story of Easter. It's a story of new creation. It's the story of new creation stepping forward and breaking through into a new day. You see, Easter is about the story of God's loyal love. Creation is not the same because Jesus overcame death. God's story is a story of generosity. His story is a story of his love, his forgiveness, his blessing to all nations. It's the story of his healing, of his reconciliation, where lives are transformed. It's the story of Jesus, God's loyal love. And I think too often the time, 
We stand there looking into a defeated, empty cavern. When we need to turn around and see what God is doing in his creation through the empty tomb, through his son, Jesus. We don't want this same old thing, right? I mean, we don't want to just keep going on and on, the same thing every day, every day. It's always the same, the same sin, the same struggle, the same people always winning, the powers that be in control, the guys that suffer are always the guys that suffer. You see, it's a new day because of Easter. Jesus says, I've come to turn this kingdom over to transform what you see, it's not the same anymore. For a reference about that unplanned part of your lesson, see Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, where Jesus takes what we know, the Sermon on the Mount, and he inverts it to show us what the kingdom of God is and new creation is all about. But Easter is about a story that you and I participate in. We participate in this story as his image bearers. You see, this is what I don't think we shout about enough. We participate when we take the story of the empty tomb out. We participate when we tell the story of that first Easter morning. But how often do we do it? How often are we really excited that God has broken through into a new world? How often are we really excited to see the sun rise and consider that it's a new creation? Things are not the same because of Easter morning. God is loyal. God is loyal love. He's loyal to his commitment. He's loyal to his promise to bless all nations. And the ultimate demonstration of his love became flesh, Jesus, and dwelt among us. God is committed to his promise of blessing all the earth, all nations. And God is committed to new creation. Easter morning and the open tomb tells us things are different today. Notice this, Revelation chapter 21. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe, who? God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for this, these words, are faithful and true. We've covered a lot of ground this morning. And to be quite honest, some fairly deep theology. God's Love, I was thinking about this. this. This wasn't your typical Easter message, you know. But God's love, it's a movement that begins on the first page of our scripture. It begins on page one. And it flows through the empty tomb and Easter morning. It's a story that flows all the way to the end of the scripture, Revelation a new creation. You see, the story of Easter is the story of God's loyal love. And it's a story that intersects you and I today. 
we are invited to step through the empty tomb into God's new creation. 